good afternoon uh, we had looked at uh, rotor side control of a three phase induction motor particularly wound rotor induction motor in the last uh, few lectures uh, so uh, what we had uh, said in those cases was because the rotor side is accessible either you can include resistance so rotor resistance control was one of the means of controlling the speed of an induction motor but it was a very lossy method that's what we said so we talked about another uh, method of recovering the slip power rather than wasting it in rotor resistance we called that as slip energy recovery so in the slip energy recovery scheme what we said was from the rotor terminals we should be able to retrieve certain amount of energy back and it can be done either using sub synchronous converter cascade which we called as static sherbius drive where we had a, a converter and inverter connected together and ultimately it was feeding back the uh, energy uh, to the stator side or the three phase side and the other one we briefly looked at was static kramer drive so in static kramer drive uh, what we had seen was to use a dc machine and the dc machine was uh, fed from the uh, slip power so uh, the torque developed was actually the total addition of the uh, torque developed by the dc machine plus uh, the uh, torque developed by the induction machine. So in that sense, we were still recovering the uh, power from the um, um, uh, rotor terminals, uh, even in static Kramer drive. Only thing is here, the total torque, what we saw was the torque of the DC motor plus the torque of the induction motor. Whereas here, we saw that the power what was actually delivered that was uh, whatever is the power taken in by the stator minus what was the power returned from the rotor side so this we called as the slip power recovery uh, but this is applicable only to wound rotor induction motor so if we are looking at uh, control from the stator side this is applicable to both wound rotor as well as uh, um, squirrel cage induction motor but primarily we talk about squirrel cage induction motor here because they are the ones which are going to be uh, maintenance free completely. So when we talk about stator side control, mainly we talk about uh, uh, squirrel cage induction motor. So there are different methods of controlling the squirrel cage induction motor from the stator side. The first and foremost and a good old method is, is, is pole changing of induction motor we'll talk about this uh, in a little while the second one is controlling the voltage that is stator voltage control of an induction motor and then comes employing an inverter for the speed control of an induction motor so that is generally known as voltage and frequency control or V by F control. Generally, this is uh, referred to as V by F control. In voltage and frequency control itself, there are three different methods we will be talking about. Uh, the first one is scalar control because we will be looking at mainly the magnitude of the voltage and the magnitude of the frequency and we will try to keep the ratio as a constant as long as the speed is below rated speed. So that is generally known as scalar control. The second method of control, which will look at the phase angle between uh, the voltage and current or 
to be precise, the phase angle between the torque producing and flux producing components of current. If they can segregate, the method can segregate the torque producing and flux producing components of current and they can be controlled independently. So uh, the current will be decomposed along the flux and perpendicular to the flux. If this is the flux, let us say, and if I'm going to have the current, overall current drawn by the stator somewhat like this, what we are going to do is to decompose this current along this flux axis and perpendicular to the flux axis. So we will call this as IDS and we will call this as IQS and we can control them independent of each other. And that is generally known as field oriented control or vector control. So vector control or field oriented control both are used synonymously and we are looking at basically decomposing the current along and perpendicular to the flux axis and that's the reason that is known as vector control. The third one which had come up only uh, about 30 years ago, I should say 40 years ago because 1984 it came up that is generally known as direct torque control which is uh, being sold as a very successful drive by ABB. So we will be looking at direct torque control as well. So these are the three methods we'll be looking at as far as the voltage and frequency control are concerned. Of course, uh, one more method we would be looking at is current source inverter based control. Because when we talk about uh, uh, voltage and frequency control. We are talking basically applying a particular value of voltage. We don't really have direct control over the current, whereas current source inverter based control is generally used in extremely large rated drives, megawatt level drives, where a current source inverter can directly feed uh, this megawatt level drive and it has various advantages over the voltage control drive. So we will uh, look at those in detail. So these are the four types of control we are going to talk about uh, when uh, 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 we uh, speak about the control from the stator side. So let's now venture into the stator side control starting from pole changing. So in pole changing, uh, all of us know that the synchronous speed, NS, if I uh, talk about uh, that in RPM, that is going to be 120 F divided by P, where F is the frequency and P is the number of poles. So if I'm going to keep the frequency as a constant, by increasing the number of poles, we will be able to reduce the speed. So will we be able to vary the number of poles and then accordingly change the speed? So this is the methodology behind pole changing. Now, uh, if you look at wound rotor induction motor, in the wound rotor induction motor, we will have stator side winding, which is a three phase winding like this. And rotor side is also going to have another winding, which is going to be a three phase winding. So this is going to be the rotor whereas this is going to be the stator. This is the way it is going to be in wound rotor induction motor. So in a wound rotor induction motor, the rotor and stator windings have to match with each other in terms of pole numbers as well as phase numbers. Like if I am winding the stator for three phase, then I should have the rotor also wound for three phase. Similarly, if I am winding the stator for four pole winding, this also should be wound for four pole. So if I change the number of poles in the stator for pole changing methodology, then I necessarily need to have the stator and rotor windings both wound for different number of poles. So if I am winding this for, let us say, eight pole and four pole, then I should have the rotor also wound for eight pole as well as four pole. So I should have multiple windings in the stator as well as multiple windings in the rotor, which will make it very, very complex if I want to employ pole changing in a wound rotor induction motor. That is the reason why 
pole changing is employed only in squirrel cage induction motor. It is employed only in squirrel cage induction motor because squirrel cage rotor can adjust itself for any number of poles or any number of phases. For example, if there is a three phase squirrel cage rotor that can be used in single phase machine as well, it can be used in two phase machine as well. There is no problem. As long as the current is not exceeding whatever value it is designed for, it will be able to work for any number of poles, any number of phases. So, only stator winding needs to be designed for different number of poles. So, we don't have to repeatedly have multiple design uh, for uh, the stator as well as rotor separately. Only the stator side needs to be designed for a multiple number of poles. This itself is complex because you have to conceive this design at the construction or uh, initial stage itself. We are not going to be able to do it later. So that is the reason why it's very, very important to uh, have this design conceived and implemented at the beginning itself. So it becomes very expensive at the construction stage itself. It has to be done properly. So in pole changing, normally what is done is, let us say I'm talking about uh, induction motor winding somewhat like this. So I'm going to have one winding, uh, one coil somewhat like this. And let's say I have one more coil somewhat like this. And I, I can have one more coil. I'm going to show about four coils in this induction mode. So you can imagine as though it is a cylinder. And if this is the cylinder that we are talking about, this is the complete uh, stator cylinder that we are talking about. And we are going to cut along this portion and then spread it out. So when you spread it out, if I call this portion as A and this portion as B, you can say this portion is A and this portion is B and that is how it is spread out. So the windings are along this axis. So the windings are here. So it goes like this. Uh, you know, this is the way it is going to be. Uh, the windings are going to be spread out. So this is how the windings are arranged along the cylinder. So now if you look at it uh, if I'm going to connect all of them let me let me call this as say a1 a2 a3 a4 a5 a6 a7 and a8 so these are the coil sites clearly so if I now connect them in series so let us say the current flows like this and it is going to flow here like this. And from here, I'm going to connect this directly in series. So the current is going to flow like this. And again, this will flow down like this. So this is the way I'm showing the current flowing in one set of coils. This is probably belonging to A phase or whatever. So I'm going to have the current flowing like this. So I can imagine as though a current I is flowing here. Let me call this as IA or something, and it is going to return in this manner. So this is going to be IA. This is returning in this particular manner. So if upward current creates a north pole, downward current creates a south pole. So I'm going to have north pole, south pole, north pole, south pole, north pole, south pole created like this with A phase current. The same way B phase current has to be 120 degrees away spatially as well as time wise. So I should have if I say that this entire thing is 360 degrees very clearly each coil uh, spans over about um, uh, 90 degrees. So I'm going to have about the second phase starting somewhere here. So this will be 120 degree point. So this is the 120 degree point spatially. So Second phase or B phase will start here. And similarly, another 120 degrees later, 
I will have C phase starting. Now, rather than making the current flow like this, let me again show these coils. Uh, so this is A1 and this is going to be A2. And I'm going to have again A3. This is going to be A4. And this is going to be A5. And this is going to be A6. And this is going to be A7. And this is going to be A8. OK, so if I just say that I'm going to connect all these coils, let us say in parallel or something like that. So let me try to look at it this way that uh, these are the two coils. And I want to connect this and this together. And similarly, I want to connect A1, A3, A5 and A7 together. All of them are connected together. So because of which if I assume that the current is flowing in this direction, the current is going to flow here. And um, I'm sorry, I have to show it as though the current here is flowing in this direction. And if the current is flowing here, I want to I want the current to flow here in this direction too. Both these things are flowing downwards. So I'm going to have South Pole created here commonly. The same way, let me remove these connections and let me reconnect them. Let me first of all mark the current direction. So let us say the current flows upward here. So I'm going to have North Pole created here. And let us say again the current uh, flows downward here in both these cases. So this is going to be South Pole here. And let us say the current flows upward here. So due to which the North Pole is going to be created at the cusp of A1 and A8 because it's folding together like this. So if I connect from here, this goes in parallel the same way this goes in parallel and this goes in parallel. So all of them are now connected in parallel. So the current is flowing into A1, A4, uh, A5 and A8. So these are going to be connected in parallel. Right? So this is connected in parallel. Whereas I'm going to have A2, A3, A6, and A7. All of them are connected in parallel. Now what happens is the current is going to return from this particular path. So let us say this is IA which is flowing into A1. Then it is flowing into A4. It is flowing into A5 and A7. Whereas it is returning through A2, A3, A6 and A7. So you can see that here two north poles and two south poles are created. So on the top diagram there are eight poles and all coils in series. Whereas if you look at the bottom diagram it has only four poles and you can see that all Four coils are in parallel. So you are going to have more number of poles here. So this could be of less speed. Whereas this will be of more speed. Or double the speed of the previous connection. So we can have actually several combinations something like this. So if I have four coils, I can connect it in either in eight pole or four pole or even in two pole configuration. So I'll be able to connect the coils in series or parallel. The same way the coils can be connected in 
the phase coils can be connected in star or delta. So that will essentially make the coils work in, uh, you know, with higher current or lower current, maybe with a higher voltage or lower voltage. So uh, with larger number of poles or lower number of poles. So I can design with certain value of torque or certain value of power or certain value of speed. So during design itself, I would be able to decide basically how much is the maximum current a particular uh, um, configuration will be able to take from which I should be able to decide what is the kind of torque it will be able to deliver or speed it will be able to deliver because of the number of poles and the frequency that is being applied or the power it can deliver. So in that sense, we should be able to control the speed in the range of probably 1 is to 2 is to 4 or so we would be able to only uh, uh, design the speed probably it could be uh, 3000 rpm or 1500 rpm or 750 rpm or 375 rpm and so on. So we should be able to obtain speeds in multiples of, uh, you know, two or four or eight and things like that. But we will not be able to obtain the speeds that are in between. That is between 3000 and 1500. If I want to achieve somewhere around 1800 or 1700, that will not be possible with pole changing kind of configuration. So pole changing, uh, the major application was there until the frequency could not be tampered with which when we could not change the frequency with the help of inverters before the advent of power electronics pole changing was being used and it was used for achieving certain values of torque or power or speed with the help of changing the pole uh, configuration by uh, series and parallel connection of windings properly so that you can achieve either two pole or four pole or eight pole configuration so we could uh, uh, achieve step changes in speed. There is one more method which is generally known as pole amplitude modulation, which is definitely a very, very complex method. But in that complex method, uh, if you look at the MMF, normally we are going to have a, a phase, B phase and C phase MMF as some kind of peak value, if I say that this is uh, Nm Im multiplied by cos uh, omega t and cos theta, whereas this is going to be Nm Im cos omega t minus 2 pi by 3 cos theta minus 2 pi by 3, whereas we are going to have this as Nm Im cos of omega t plus 2 pi by 3 and this will be cos of theta uh, plus 2 pi by 3 where theta is talking about the uh, spatial shift of the winding whereas omega t is the time shift of a phase b phase and c phase currents respectively and when we add all these three we ultimately arrive at the revolving magnetic field. That's how we talk about the revolving magnetic field theory in the case of a three phase induction motor. Rather than uh, using a constant value of peak MMF, if we modulate this itself with uh, some kind of cos alpha, cos, uh, uh, you know, alpha minus 2 pi by 3 and cos alpha plus 2 pi by 3, or I'm going to modulate this itself, the peak value itself, then that can actually give rise to variable number of poles instantaneously being seen by uh, uh, the rotor. So that is essentially going to give rise to variation in the speed itself. So pole amplitude modulation talks about uh, modulating the peak value, modulating the peak value of a phase, B phase, and C phase 
MMS. So this is definitely a very complicated method, so I'm not going into the details of this, but if uh, somebody is interested, they might like to refer to uh, one of the old induction motor books like Alger or uh, one of those will definitely give you more details about uh, pole amplitude modulation. So as far as pole changing goes, uh, the advantage is that it can be used in squirrel cage induction motor and you would be able to obtain different speeds and different torques and different powers with uh, um, either star or delta connected binding or series or parallel connected binding. The disadvantage, the major disadvantage is you will only be able to get step changes in speed. It will not be possible to um, uh, obtain any in-between values of speed. And one more thing is this has to be done at the construction stage itself. It cannot be done later with the help of any kind of control methodology. So, so much so for uh, pole changing. Now let us try to take a look at stator voltage control. So the state voltage control is very similar to what we talked about earlier in the form of soft start for starting the induction motor. So uh, if I am uh, imagining a star connected induction motor with only one terminal that is available for the control of uh, or uh, for applying the voltage. So this is the star connected induction motor and I'm going to have uh, the back to back connected uh, thyristor, which is connected somewhat like this. So this goes to the A phase and the second phase is here, which is going to the B phase. So uh, we can imagine either uh, two con uh, thyristors connected in anti parallel or we can imagine one triac. So triac is essentially equivalent to having uh, both the thyristors connected in anti-parallel. So in triac, what you see normally is we are going to have uh, one triangle shown like this, and we are going to have another triangle shown like this. And we are going to have, uh, this is generally known as MT1 terminal. This is going to be MT2 terminal, and there is going to be a gate terminal. So this is essentially the structure of a triac. So you would give positive gate pulse and negative gate pulse depending upon uh, whether it is during positive half cycle or negative half cycle at what point you want this device to conduct. So the third phase is now connected to the other triac or back to back connected thyristor pair. Somewhat like this. Now this is connected here. So uh, this is A phase and this is going to be B phase and this is going to be C phase. So if it's a star connected uh, winding, we are going to again uh, connect the uh, back to back connected thyristors like this in all the three phases. And depending upon what is the kind of voltage that uh, we want to uh, apply, whether we want to apply full voltage or partial voltage, Depending upon that, we are going to choose a firing angle. If I choose a firing angle somewhat like this, this is alpha uh, in A phase, and I'm going to have this as pi plus alpha, which is going to be corresponding to the firing angle for T4. If I call this as T1, this is the firing point of T1, and this is going to be the firing point of T4. So this is A phase voltage. The same way, uh, T uh, if I call this as T3 and I'm going to call this as T6, this is T5 and this is T2. So uh, T1 is fired at, let us say, alpha. T2 is going to be fired at pi by 3 plus alpha. And T3 is going to be fired at, at 2 pi by 3 plus alpha and so on. So this is the way each of these devices are going to be fired. So we are applying a lower amount of RMS voltage, although it is non-sinusoidal, there is no doubt. So this is the kind of application of voltage that is going to happen. Now, if you think about what is the kind of speed torque characteristics we had for the induction motor, the induction motor speed torque characteristics was somewhat like this. So let us say this is uh, TE, 
and this is going to be the speed. So this is the speed. So this particular uh, value of torque corresponds to the maximum torque. So this is the breakdown torque or maximum torque. Now uh, we wrote the expression for torque somewhat like this T E equal to 3 V1 square divided by R1 plus R2 dash divided by S the whole square plus X1 plus X2 dash the whole square. So this is what was at the denominator and in the numerator we had R2 dash divided by S times omega S, where S is the slip and omega S is the synchronous speed in radians per second. So this is what was the torque. So in general, we can say if the frequency is not going to be touched, if this is going to remain as a constant, and if the parameters of the induction motors are all, uh, they are going to remain as a constant, then torque is proportional to V1 square. So if this is with 100% V1. If I reduce the voltage to say 50%, then the torque will actually be proportional to 0.5 square. So that will be 25% uh, of whatever is the breakdown torque. So if I try to reduce uh, the voltage to something like 50%, then I'm going to have uh, the characteristics somewhat like, like this. So this is going to be corresponding to 50% V1. So the torque will decrease tremendously when I decrease the voltage even slightly. So if I try to look at a particular value of torque being delivered by the induction motor, the va variation in the speed is really, really minimal. So speed variation is not much, whereas torque is reduced quite a bit. The torque is going to be reduced tremendously. So this is the major problem with stator voltage control. You are not going to be able to really achieve good amount of speed variation but the torque is going to be reduced tremendously. Rather than having a low slip induction motor, what I mean is if the induction motor is going to have very, very small rotor losses, then I'm going to have the characteristics almost flat. If I try to look at how the induction motor characteristics are, this is omega m and this is going to be te. This is the way it is when rotor copper losses are low. If the rotor copper losses are somewhat higher, I will have uh, the characteristics of the induction motor to be drooping. So this is R2 is higher. When we talk about R2 being higher, this is the way it is going to be. So if uh, I uh, look at the voltage coming down with R2 being higher, then I would see at least a good amount of variation as far as the speed is concerned. The torque reduces, all right, no doubt, when the voltage is decreasing. But we will have variation in the speed also pronounced whenever you're going to have the R2 value to be higher. So in high slip induction motor, where the rotor copper losses are somewhat higher, you would see stator voltage control will depict more range in speed control. So whenever we are talking about speed control, if the uh, slip is somewhat higher inherently in an induction motor, then it may see, see more of, so let me again show it with the help of characteristics. If I'm going to have, let us say this is uh, corresponding to 100% uh, um, voltage, whereas for 25% or 75% uh, voltage, this is the kind of characteristics I have. And I'm talking about a particular torque that is being supplied by the induction motor. So this is the 
low tar that is being supplied by the induction motor. So this is omega m and this is t. So you can see in this particular case that I am having one speed at this point, whereas another speed is so close. Whereas if I am looking at an induction motor, which is inherently having a huge amount of droop. So this is omega m and this is te. It is having a huge amount of droop. And if I am looking at another characteristics where I have reduced the voltage quite a bit. So this is with 100% V1. This is with, let us say, 70% V1. And if I am looking at a particular value of tar being supplied by the induction motor, here at least I see certain uh, difference between these two speeds. What I have seen, this is uh, uh, one of the speeds that has been attained with 100% voltage, and this is the speed that has been attained with 70% voltage. That is at least some difference in the speed. So when we are talking about larger slip induction motor, the speed variation will be more pronounced with state voltage control. Whereas if we, we are talking about an induction mo motor where inherently the rotor copper losses are very limited, that means it is a low slip induction motor, highly efficient induction motor, the state voltage control is not going to be really, really effective. That is one thing. Second thing I would like to emphasize here is if we are looking at fan or pump type of load. Even a small variation in the speed will result in a huge variation in the power delivery because uh, in fan or pump type of load, torque is proportional to omega m square and power is going to be proportional to omega m cube. And power is actually pro, uh, uh, an index of how much is the fluid that is delivered from the fan or pump, how much of wind is delivered by the fan or how much of uh, fluid is delivered or water is delivered by the pump. So that is uh, exactly decided by how much is the power that is taken in or consumed by the induction machine. So, if let us say I'm talking about 100% speed. At 100% speed, the power delivered is going to be 100%. So let us say the power is also 100%. Whereas if I'm talking about 80% speed, if I'm talking about 80% speed, the power is going to be 0.8 Q. So 0.8 multiplied by 0.8 multiplied by 0.8. That will be corresponding to approximately 0.512. So the power delivered is only 50% approximately. So that means if I want to reduce the fluid delivery or the wind delivery from a fan from 100% to 50%, all I need to do is to reduce the speed only to 80%. I don't have to reduce the speed tremendously. So even a smaller variation in speed will be able to make a difference in terms of how much fluid is delivered in the case of a fan or pump. So the state voltage control, which will be able to effect only a small variation in speed, will be still in a position to effect a large variation in the fluid delivery if I use state voltage control for a fan or pump drive. And it is a very, very simple scheme. That is the major advantage. The state voltage control scheme is going to be a very, very simple scheme and still it will be able to effect a good amount of change. So let us try to look at uh, uh, state voltage control applied to fan or pump drive. So what happens when I apply state voltage control to a fan? So let us try to first of all write what is the electromagnetic torque expression in a three phase induction motor that will be 3i2 square r2 dash divided by s omega s. Or I can say i2 dash square r2 dash divided by s omega s. So this is the electromagnetic torque, torque developed by developed by the induction motor.
Whereas if I try to write the same thing in terms of load torque for uh, a fan or pump drive, I can write this as some K times omega M square. So this is the torque required by the fan or pump. Now in steady state, these two have to be equal to each other. So let me write this as K omega M square should be equal to 3 I2 square R2 divided by S omega S. And I can write from here I2 square will be equal to K omega M square. I can say 3 R2 and omega S. All of them are machine constants because uh, the machine is working at a particular frequency. It is working at a particular rotor resistance and 3 is a constant. So let me write this as some K1. And I should be able to write this S on the top. So I'm writing this as S. Now, omega M, which is the mechanical speed, will be 1 minus S times omega S, which is actually the synchronous speed. So I can write this as some K2, K divided by K1, I'm writing as K2, multiplied by 1 minus S whole square, multiplied by omega S square, multiplied by S. So this is going to be I2 square uh, or I2 dash square, whatever. So this is the current square. Whatever is the current drawn by the induction motor whole square. Now I should be able to write this as some K dash K2 multiplied by omega S square. I can write as K dash and I can write 1 minus S whole square multiplied by S. So I should be able to write current, which is I2, that should be equal to, or it is uh, proportional to some constant C uh, 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 multiplied by 1 minus S multiplied by root of S, square root of S. So this is I2 expression. Now, this what this says is the current requirement uh, of the fan or pump drive is proportional to 1 minus s, which is actually 1 minus slip and square root of slip. So let me see at what point this current drawn by the fan or pump drive, which is driven by a three phase induction motor, reaches its maximum. At what slip it reaches its maximum? So I can say di2 divided by ds equal to zero. This is where at this slip, uh, a fan or pump driven by a three-phase induction motor draws maximum I2. At this particular slip only, it is going to draw maximum value of I2. So, let me try to differentiate this particular expression. So this is going to be um, 1 minus S multiplied by uh, half multiplied by S power minus half. And UDV and VDU is minus. So this is uh, 1 minus S differentiated will be minus and root S I have to write as such. So this is S power half. So this has to be equal to zero. So I can write this as this is 1 minus s divided by 2 root s minus root s equal to zero. So I can just take this 2 root s on the top. So this is going to be 1 minus s minus 2s equal to zero, which gives me s equal to 1 by 3. So what this implies is at a slip of 1 by 3, when the slip is 0.33, uh, we are going to have uh, the induction motor driving a fan or pump drive, a fan or pump that is going to draw maximum amount of current. So 
if i am going to implement stator voltage control and by chance if i want to have the speed range from 100% of rated speed to point 1 minus 0.33 of rated speed that is the slip if it becomes a uh, 0.33 in that case at this particular portion when the slip is going to be 0.33 the current drawn will be extremely large or it will be maximum so i should be able to calculate if i want to say what is the i2 max that is drawn divided by i2 rated if i want to look at the ratio of the two i should be able to write this as 1 minus 0.33 that is the maximum uh, uh, current drawn that happens at a slip value of 0.33 and i should say root of 0.33 root of 0.33 Okay. divided by I should say I2 rated will correspond to 1 minus S rated whatever is the rated slip and I'm going to have root of point uh, uh, S rated. So let me try to calculate this clear. What I'm trying to calculate is what is the ratio of I2 max to I2 rated. That's what I want to calculate. So let me write this I2 max divided by I2 rated is going to be 1 minus 0.33 multiplied by square root of 0.33 divided by 1 minus S rated multiplied by root of S rated. Now, let me take an induction machine for example. If I say yes, rated is equal to 0.1. If I try to calculate for S rated equal to 0.1 and S rated equal to 0.2. For these two cases, let me calculate. 1 minus 1 by 3 is 2 by 3. And I'm going to have square root of uh, 1 by 3. So I'm going to have here root 3 coming up and then 1 minus S rated that is going to be 1 minus 0.1 and root of S rated that is 0.1. So if I calculate this, when I calculate this particular value corresponding to S equal to 0.1, I'm getting this to be 1.35. I max uh, divided by that is I max divided by I rated. I max happens at slip equal to 1 by 3 and I rated is at rated slip. So this is the ratio of I max to I rated. So if it is a 100 uh, ampere induction motor, normally it draws 100 ampere. It is going to draw 135 ampere at S equal to 1 by 3 as per this particular calculation if the rated slip of the induction motor is 0.1. The same way if I try to calculate for S equal to 0.2, I should say I max divided by I rated for an induction motor which has S equal to 0.2 which is driving a fan or pump load which is operating at slip equal to 1 by 3, I'm going to have this as 2 divided by 3 root 3 multiplied by 1 minus 0 0.2, which is 0 0.8 and square root of 0 0.2. And this happens to be the answer for this comes out to be 1.07. So what I'm trying to tell you is that if the rated slip is lower, the ratio of maximum current to rated current becomes very large. If the rated slip is higher, that is it is a lossy induction motor. Inherently, it is going to have more amount of uh, copper losses in the rotor. 
then we are going to have uh, uh, the maximum current to the rated current, the ratio decreases. So if I want to have an induction motor, which is uh, running a fan or which is driving a fan or pump, and I want to have the ratio of uh, uh, the maximum speed uh, has to go down to uh, like 100% to it has to come down to uh, one third of uh, or rather two third of rated speed. That is the slip maximum slip has to be one third, one by three. In that case, it is going to draw really, really a large current. So even at a slip of one by three, if I want the current not to go beyond the rated value, let us say I have a 100 ampere induction motor. And I want this induction motor to be a driving a fan or pump load and I want the slip to be uh, one by three, probably even in steady state for a, a wide range of speed control. So R is equal to one by three. Still, it should not be drawing more than 100 ampere. I don't want it to draw more than 100 ampere, which means even at normal condition, it will be able to deliver only one by 1.35 times the uh, uh, rated current. Only then I will be ensuring that this particular induction motor will not be overloaded even at S equal to 1 by 3, which is the worst case of operation. So that means even under uh, um, rated slip condition, under rated slip condition, if it is drawing only 74 amperes of current, only then at slip equal to 1 by 3, it will be drawing a current of 100 ampere, not anything more than that. So I am derating my induction motor. Basically, the induction motor is rated for 100 ampere, but if I want to use it for fan or pump drive until slip equal to 1 by 3, then even at rated slip condition, I should not be running it for more than 74 amperes of current. On the other hand, if I am looking at the same induction motor having rated slip of 0.2, the derating of the induction motor will be decreased quite a bit. That will be only 1 divided by 1.07. So which means almost 93% of the rated current can be drawn by the induction motor even at rated slip. So what we are getting at in this particular case is if we are using stator voltage control technique and if we are looking at the speed control range to be 100% to almost 66%, that is slip equal to 1 by 3, in that case, at a slip of 1 by 3, the current drawn by the induction motor is going to be quite high. And how much it is higher than the rated current depends upon what is the rated slip of the induction motor. If the rated slip of the induction motor is larger and larger, then the ratio of maximum current to rated current decreases. So the derating of the induction motor also correspondingly, it's not too high. So for a slip of 0.2, when you go to a slip of 0.33, you will be a drawing rated current only if you derate the induction motor by nine, uh, from 100% to 93%. Whereas when you talk about a rated slip of 0.1, you will be derating the induction motor almost to uh, the 74% uh, of its original value uh, uh, if the uh, rated slip had been 0.1. So the stator voltage control technique as a rule is applied to high slip induction motor, which has rotor copper losses. And it is also particularly employed only for fan or pump drive. So this has very, very limited uh, uh, applicability. So on the whole, if you look at stator voltage control technique, there are mainly three applications for stator voltage control technique. 
One is soft start, which already we talked about. Then the second one is speed control. Or power control for a fan or pump drive. The third type of application normally we see for stator voltage control technique is energy. Saving. At light loads. So if we are looking at an induction motor, we say that I1 is consisting of I2 dash plus IM, where I2 dash is the rotor current and IM is the magnetizing current. If the induction motor is delivering rated load, rated torque, so at rated torque, the flux also has to be rated value. If the flux is not at rated value, we are not going to be able to develop rated torque. That is one of the major problems if you try to reduce the flux. But if we are delivering light load, whenever we are going to have light load torque on the induction machine, in that case, we really do not need to have the flux at rated value. Flux can also be decreased. So if the flux is decreased, that means we are going to have magnetizing current decreasing. If the magnetizing current is decreased, then core losses will also decrease. So if the core losses decrease and we are not really drawing a large amount of I2 dash because the load on the induction motor itself is light, so I2 dash is also not much. So we are going to see that even the rotor copper losses are not too high. Because of core loss decreasing and magnetizing current decreasing, the overall power factor of the induction motor will improve. So if the power factor of the induction motor is good and core losses are automatically decreasing, then uh, efficiency or efficiency of the induction motor at light load will be better than what efficiency it would have been with full flux value. So the efficiency of the induction motor would have been better in this case with reduced flux. So when you have reduced flux, you are going to have a better efficiency for the induction motor. So in that sense, uh, um, uh, the magnetizing current can be decreased if the voltage is decreased because V is proportional to rather for transformer equation, we can write E is proportional to flux multiplied by frequency. So if we are going to reduce the flux at a constant frequency, automatically E has to be decreased. So at reduced voltage, flux will be automatically decreased. Because flux decreases, you will have better power factor and better efficiency. So it is as good as saving energy in the form of uh, reducing the core losses basically in the system. So this is effective whenever the induction motor is going to run on lighter load. So uh, stator voltage control technique can be used for energy saving. The stator voltage control technique can be used for energy sa saving. Only if the induction motor the load on the induction motor or torque demand is less than 50% of T rated. Only if we are going to have the torque demand less than 50% of rated torque. So the stator voltage control technique will be very effective for energy saving in the case of an induction motor, if especially if it is its magnetic circuit is not very good, 
you're already going to have a good amount of core losses. If you reduce the flux, then automatically core losses are going to decrease drastically. And if the induction motor is going to work on lighter load most of the times, then you will have better efficiency for the induction motor when you make it work on a low value of voltage or lower values of flux. So in general, we can say stator voltage control technique is uh, uh, used for three different uh, specific uh, 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 purposes. One is for starting the induction motor, especially uh, uh, on lighter load if you are going to start the induction motor, not with heavy load torque. So this is not definitely applicable for electric vehicles, for example, where you are going to start with a very, very heavy weight that has to be hauled. So soft start is applicable only when you are starting an induction motor on light load. That can be done with stator voltage control technique. Uh, speed control can be achieved to certain extent, but it is only for mainly fan or pump type of load. And we will also be able to achieve uh, energy saving at light loads, provided uh, uh, the machine is not a very uh, 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 well-designed machine in terms of its magnetic circuit, first thing. And second thing is the machine is going to run on lighter load for a pretty a large portion of its life. In those cases, you should be able to reduce the magnetizing current, improve the power factor, and hence improve the efficiency by reducing the core losses. So much so for uh, state voltage control technique as well as um, pole changing. So in the next class, we'll be looking at uh, voltage and frequency control, particularly scalar control of a three-phase induction.